Right, Doug, this is fresh from the locker room of tales of my life from 2013 um, about a company that I think is a bit of a national treasure now in the UK um, called Bloom and Wild. So concept, basically, can you can you find a way to get flowers delivered to an address, be that commercial or personal, in a really, really efficient way? When it was subscription, was it mainly like businesses? Like what individuals have flowers delivered on a regular basis? I think you'd be surprised. That, so what, um, what do you get if you're a consumer then? Like, I, I know there's various product SKUs, but you mm. get, it's like a subscription. So every month you get some like petals through the post you shove in your house. Just petals, yeah, and you could drop them in front of, you know, your partner's feet as they walk to the bathroom in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> right, Doug, this is fresh from the locker room of tales of my life from 2013 um, about a company that I think is a bit of a national treasure now in the UK um, called Bloom and Wild. They operate in the flower is it the flower industry, the horticultural industry, the flower industry? I don't know what kind of vertical industry it would be called. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of how we worked with Aaron and Ben, the founders, in 2013, if that's all right. Uh, love it. What do they do? They deliver your flowers, some flowers to your house. At very, very basics. That's how it all started. Yeah. So 2013, just to give you a bit of a, a shape of where I was in my career at the time. So I was two years in agency, didn't really have a grasp on where I wanted that kind of digital agency to go. But I had a really good kind of, well, I thought at the time I had a really good capability to understand problems and opportunities and be able to translate that into decent product. Um, we didn't have as many tools out then as to, to be able to help us build product quickly like there are nowadays. So you had to build a lot of it from scratch. Um, but Ben had already been, so Ben obviously co-founded Mahara, had already been in the stable the Say Digital Stable for a couple of years. And he introduced me to a chap called Aaron Gelbard. So Aaron was relatively fresh out of Harvard, um, super, super smart guy, um, comes from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, as I later found out from, you know, reading his stories, he's kind of progressed um, and came to, came to speak to me on recommendation of Ben to build out his MVP for his new company that he was founded with a chap called Ben Stanway. So concept, um, Basically, can you can you find a way to get flowers delivered to an address, be that commercial or personal, in a really, really efficient way? Because you think about Interflora and you think about that kind of flower experience, even now, to be honest, outside of Bloom and Wild. But back then it was horrendous. You know, it was very much like you go here, you choose a very static kind of picture. There's no way that you can go and um, modify or adapt anything you want to buy. You don't know when it's being delivered and it's very, very expensive. So Aaron and Ben's, uh, strategy was to kind of go direct to source out of Holland and then be able to do subscription packages through the post. So fraught with challenges, how on earth do you get the flowers to stay fresh once they're cut? How do you deliver them? How do you instruct people to make them? But most importantly, deliver them through the post so you don't have to be in and then have it on a subscription. So we started building out this, um, we started building out the concept of it. I remember sitting in the pub discussing logo designs and box designs with them. So we're talking right at the beginning of this company. Um, and for the preceding six to 12 months, we went about building their um, subscription website um, and experience in Magento. Horrendous, horrendous for us, horrendous for Aaron, but there wasn't much else out there. There was no off the shelf subscription tools back then. And then got them launched and got them launched and got them to the position where they could go and raise their first piece of capital. Um, and rather interestingly, you know, having seen, you know, having seen the founders go from that piece to what they've gone through now, it was a, a huge, huge learning curve for me, but just some high level numbers to give you some fat to chew on. From starting with 30,000 in savings, you know, and I know how much we got their product out for, it was about five grand, five or six grand to get the MVP up. They went on to having a turnover of about 400 grand, maybe a year and a bit later, raised some decent capital. And by the time they'd just come through COVID, they were doing 145 million pounds in revenue. In the UK? In the UK and across Europe. So they did some acquisitions. So a company called Bloomon and another one um, another one in Europe. I think it was Germany. So wh um, what do you get if you're a consumer then? Like, I, I know there's various product SKUs, but you get, mm. it's like a subscription. So every month you get some like petals through the post you shove in your house. 
just petals yeah and you could drop them in front of you know your partner's feet as they walk to the bathroom in the morning <laughs> yeah um it started at this we started off with i think three different bouquets bouquets um back in 2013 that was the thing that started and you could choose your cadence it was delivered on a thursday so you had to get your order in by a certain cutoff period monday or tuesday and then it was sorted and then out to post on the thursday i think now it's gone beyond that i think you can choose your day of the week you can get it delivered whenever you want you can select your cadence it can be weekly it can be monthly you does it have to be subscription or can you just get a one-off back back in the back in the origin of the business it was subscription and then you could also buy um you could buy that for a certain delivery date as an individual now it's very much a shop as well so you can so go it- buy that <laughs> was it when it was subscription? Was it mainly like businesses? Like what individuals have flowers delivered on a regular basis? I think you'd be surprised. I, That's quite niche, isn't be, it? The first customers were individuals. They really were. They wanted people that I think there was a an element of targeting metro areas. You know that you might want to have fresh flowers every week or every two weeks. Um, and I think the first the first customers were actually were B two C customers rather than B two B. I'm sure that's, that's wildly right. changed. Okay um since then but fascinating yeah. story and also just a bit of pop culture around it have you ever heard of a startup called Moneybox, where you save your oh, yeah i'm pretty sure i have them on my phone yeah so money box was founded by ben who co-founded bloom and wild after he left after two years so a pair of founders aaron and ben one went to form bloom and wild which is now doing you know couple hundred million turnover and one that also went to go and found Moneybox, which has had an independently successful fintech journey. And, you know, I've the formation of our venture model came out of that time. And it came out of that time for seeing two individuals that came through that were smart, knew their sectors, MBA trained, more on that coming soon, eh, Doug? Um, and were able to go and build out two fantastic businesses. And I, I got to see them firsthand. Which is why we want to work with MBA graduates, and which is why we've got this report coming out, you know, because we want to make sure that we can bed into that. Can we talk about the the report? Now, shall we? Like, what 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 have people got to look forward to in that report, or should I talk I about think, it? Well, I can we talk about the vision first. So obviously, and then you can talk about the practicalities and what you've actually done, which is fantastic. So we we wanted to really take a look at two sides of the founders that we've invested in, the founders that we want to invest in. And one side of that is the sector specialist, people that have been in industry. And it was a bit challenging to kind of look at the data around how successful sector specialists are. So could we look at MBA programs? Could we look at MBA colleges and, and whether there is an advantage to having an MBA to becoming an exited founder? Um, and through the conversations that we had, typically at the start and end of the Bear With Me calls, um, you know, is there anything we could do? And you you put forward the suggestion that we we should do a significant amount of research into those schools into those countries and just see if we can pull out any findings about which schools are the most successful or churn out the the, the, the highest number of exited founders. And that's what we've done, isn't it? We scraped, it took 1300 um, hours and we scraped every exit for the last 10 years. And then we mapped those exits back to who was the founder, what's the founder's background, and then any that had an MBA um, we looked at where they got the MBA from. And so now we have the only data set that exists in the world of um, which MBA programs in the last 10 years have spawned the most successful founders. Um, and that report's coming out, I think, next week, or it might be out. So it's going it to be out next, next week. week. So we're this just week? putting together the release strategy for it so we can make sure that we can get the most interaction around it. Um, we're actually going to be using it. I've got to talk to you about this. We've got to be using a strategy that was used for the data around venture studios. A chap called Max Polk did a really good job of bringing together a community and launching a report that built a tremendous amount of enthusiasm off the back. And I want to essentially clone his strategy um, to be able to do that because I think it was really good. So next week is when we're looking to do it. Yep. It's going to be good. And I think what I like about it, so we have literally got by region – Last 10 years, which MBA programs have spawned the most um, successful founders? So Europe, North America, Asia, Africa. And what I love about this is that it just goes against, it's just actually the truth. So there's a nice story, which is Mark Zuckerberg leaves fucking Harvard and sets up Facebook. And, you know, Peter Thiel loves investing Mm -hmm. in 20-year-olds and telling them to leave their courses that can work and that does work, but 
there are so many founders that are um, that have got MBAs and have learned some pretty hard commercial skills on how to run a business, and they take that and they translate that into a, starting a business. Average startup founder age, successful exit is something like four in their forties, forty five. Like the 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 narrative in the press and the reality are two very different things. And this report shows that we don't just, you know, we've looked at that. We've spent thousands of hours going, okay, cool. Do MBA spawn successful entrepreneurs? And the answer is yes, in 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 their thousands. So this old, yeah, because I'm one of those people that's like fucking MBA. <laughs> fuck off why bother with that just go and get some real world experience and um, whilst that's what i have done clearly there was a huge benefit as demonstrated by the thousands of founders mm. we have found and the bloom and wild guys and ben and countless other people that get in the nba mm. is clearly a huge advantage and it helps there's no doubt it's not for everyone probably wouldn't have been for me um, maybe it wasn't for you but it is definitely a good path and it definitely yeah. creates something i mean we've just to kind of close off the episode we've you know long had this vision you know born from the fact of working with ben born from the fact of working with founders like aaron that there is a level of training and a level of focus that it provides you and it's not anything it's not everything you still need the vision you still need the drive you still need everything else that comes into being an entrepreneur but there is a certain um there's a certain skill set that makes you very dangerous and i think combining that trained focused emba mba graduate with a sector specialist or something like that or a technical co-founder is could be incredibly powerful yeah because what i love is i love sales street fire so like um an mba um and then someone technical that those yeah. three things and if you can be as many of those, I think if you've got, you're probably not going to get one person that has all three, although sometimes you can. But if you've got an MBA slash sales hustle street fighter, you get those together and then they find some sort of technical capability. That's incredible. Um, that technical capability is Mahara, because right? that So all of those street fighters need to come to exactly. Mahara and we'll go build that, some businesses together. If you're MBA product sales, but you just need an engine... V8 or a big kilowatt hour battery if I've got to be all new world prefer a 7 litre V8 it so we are going to put a link to the report cow down below so if you want to um, if you want to look at the Maha report look at which MBA programs spawn the most entrepreneurs in the world that report exists. It's the only the only the only company anywhere in the world that's created this data that exists. You can click on the link below. Um, that's the end. Thank you very much, Doug. <laughs>